so everything was going very well until a few months later there was an editorial in nature on the front page of nature called a book for burning written by the editor sir john maddox um, and maddox was incredibly angry about this book and was very very upset about it and um, wrote it it was one of the most intemperate emotional pieces that most people can remember reading in a scientific journal denouncing the book and basically saying that i should be excommunicated from the scientific world um, he compared himself to the pope um, and uh, me to galileo which wasn't a very fortunate uh, mm. comparison Rupert Sheldrake has been a Cambridge University Don, acknowledged as one of the brightest biochemists of his generation, winner of the University Botany Prize, former research fellow of the Royal Society, uh, the Frank Knox Fellow at Harvard University, and fellow of Clare College, Cambridge. He's also the writer of many books, including A New Science of Life, the Presence of the Past, Seven Experiments That Could Change the World, and The Science Delusion. So, Rupert Sheldrake, thank you very much indeed for joining me today. Good to be with you. Can I take you back to 1981? I mean, you're probably most famous for your ideas on morphic resonance. Can you tell us something about about those ideas, how they originated, and can you bring us up to date as to your latest thinking on that, and if your ideas have changed at all? I came across, I came up with the idea of morphic resonance when I was doing research on plant development at Cambridge, um, and it's really to do with the inheritance of form. The word morphic means form in Greek. Um, so it's a kind of resonance of form, that's the original idea. But I'll explain just how I think it works in a moment. But when I thought about this idea, I realized it has enormous implications. It's really about memory and nature, not just the memory of form in plants, but about the whole of nature I'm suggesting has a kind of memory. The so-called laws of nature are more like habits. But the usual view is that all the laws of nature were there at the moment of the Big Bang, like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code. Um, and they've been the same ever since, and so have the constants. Um, but I think they're habits and that they evolve. And I, what I suggest is that every species has a kind of collective memory. Um, it, it, every hedgehog, uh, as it grows up, tunes into the collective memory of hedgehogs, a form as it's growing in its mother's womb, and then of instincts when it starts behaving. All those are collective habits. So I'm suggesting that a lot of inheritance is not coded in the genes. Genes code for proteins and the sequence of amino acids in proteins, but not for instincts, shapes, forms, and so on. In that sense, it's a very controversial theory. Um, and um, it's a testable theory. Uh, it suggests that if the crystals, uh, it applies to crystals and molecules as well as animals and plants, and, and um, it applies to all self-organizing systems. So crystals are self-organizing. Uh, so if you make a new chemical that's never existed before and you crystallize it, you may have to wait a while for a whole new morphic field of uh, the shape of, of the lattice structure of the crystal to come into being. But once it's happened, it get, makes it easier to happen again. And the more often it happens, the easier it gets. So in fact, crystals become easier to crystallize all over the world as time goes on. This is a known fact. Uh, if you train rats to learn a new trick in London, rats in New York and Melbourne, Australia and New Delhi should all learn the same trick quicker just because the rats have learned it in London. And if you do the Wordle five letter word puzzle uh, in the evening, it should be easier to solve it than if you do it in the morning, because so many millions of people will already have solved it. So this is a very testable hypothesis. Um, and the, in my book, A New Science of Life, I mainly applied it to biological morphogenesis and to chemistry, molecular biology and chemistry. Um, in my second book, The Presence of the Past, 
um, I deal with it in relation to memory uh, and collective memory and cultural inheritance and evolution as well as biological form and instincts. So the, the idea basically um, leads to a completely different interpretation of um, inheritance and also of memory itself, because it suggests that memories are not stored in the brain. Instead, we resonate with ourselves in the past. Morphic resonance is based on similarity of form and vibratory pattern in self-organizing systems. The more similar, the stronger the resonance. And because each of us is more similar to ourselves in the past, the strongest resonance acting on us is from our own past. So I think that memory uh, is transmitted by morphic resonance, not stored in physical structures in the brain, uh, memory traces, which is the conventional theory. So all of this is obviously controversial, um, but it's been tested. And in the new edition, the third edition of my book, A New Science of Life, I summarize 30 years of research on morphic resonance, which includes tests on um, with learning in Dale chicks, it involves tests with human learning um, and a variety of other experiments. Um, so far, the evidence supports the hypothesis, uh, but it will need a lot more evidence uh, to convince the skeptics, of course. Um, so I would say, uh, to put it at its most general, it's very much an open question as to whether this happens or not. I personally think it does, otherwise I wouldn't have spent so much time working on this uh, subject and uh, which i still do so uh, the important thing about it being is that you've put forward a theory then which is a falsifiable theory in in popper's terms it's something which can be tested and what would you say is the best evidence for it that we've found so far or you've found so far well um it's hard to pick out one particular strand of evidence. Um, I would think that some of the human learning experiments, so there's most work has been done in human learning. And I think some of the uh, learning experiments are, um, you know, fairly persuasive, you know, things get easier to learn after others have learned them. Uh, there was an experiment done with crossword puzzles from the evening standard, were they easier to solve the day after they were published than the day before. Um, this, of course, involved comparing a new crossword. We had to get the evening standard to give us the crossword in advance. Um, and this was done before papers were online. So uh, we tested students in Nottingham at Nottingham University um, the day before the, the crossword was published with a control crossword. Another group of students was tested the day after. Um, and the question was relative to the control. Uh, did the evenings, the one that's just been published, get easier? And it did. Um, but, so but how, kind of, what kind of what kind of um, factor are we talking about here? Is this? A... Gosh, I'm sorry, I just can't remember the. Oh, right. Presumably, it was significant, though. Oh yes, it? yes, it was a statistically significant effect, um, um, and the at the moment i the experiments i'm trying to uh, arrange um already some preliminary ones have been done uh, with the nematode worm sine rhabditis elegans which is one of the main uh, model organisms in biology um training the worms to associate a particular chemical with food so it's like a conditioned reflex they learn to wriggle towards the smell if they've learned that it's associated with food. It's already been shown that this is inherited. If you train the worms to do this, uh, subsequent generations are attracted to the same food. Uh, without any genetic mutations, this is called epigenetic inheritance. Um, and uh, what I think is that epigenetic inheritance is largely because of morphic resonance it may involve molecular changes in fact it does involve some molecular changes methylation of the dna and things like that which leads to genes being switched on or off and uh, switching on or off being inherited but i think there's more to it than that and in these experiments that are going on or about to happen some have already happened uh, what we do is have a control to look for in the epigenetic um, 
experiment. What you do is train the worms over a number of generations to associate um, a particular smell with food. And then when you test their children, their offspring, after they've been trained over generations, then they're attracted to the food, which is what you'd expect is some epigenetic inheritance effect. But then you have another lot of worms which have never been exposed to this food, and you test those, and uh, those also are more attracted to this food than they were initially, um, because I think they, there's a morphic resonance carryover um, that affects all the worms of that particular breed. So, so these are worm, these are worms which are not descendants of, uh, they're not a second or third generation. These are these are other ones who have. This is parallel strain that's never oh. been exposed. Yes, so. so that's what I call the morphic resonance control. And what I'm trying to do at the moment is persuade people who work on epigenetics to include a morphic resonance control. What they do at the moment is show that if you do something to train worms or train fruit flies to respond to a particular smell, then the descendants inherit that tendency. It fades away usually after a few generations. But what they don't do is see whether other flies or worms would also uh, behave like that to a, probably to a lesser extent. Um, so I'm suggesting including morphic resonance controls in the epigenetic experiments be a good way of testing for morphic resonance, because instead of saying to people, this is morphic resonance research, which is controversial and would really cause alarm bells to sound, um, you just say it's a morphic resonance control. Uh, just in case there's anything in morphic resonance, let's see whether that could lead to an explanation of epigenetics. Um, so that's my new ploy with research methods with morphic resonance to, uh, as it were, ride on the back of epigenetic research, which is doing morphic resonance type tests um, and include uh, a line which would test for morphic resonance, which would be a parallel line of organisms that have not been exposed to the training stimulus. Right. There's a there's echoes here in in, in my mind. I'm only being a layman in in the field of of, uh, of biology um, of Lamarckism, which no doubt um, um, people have, have mentioned to you. And how how does it differ from from that, which of course is a discredited mechanism for for Darwinism, that you inherit characteristics, acquired characteristics, I should say. But but this is this is running parallel to that or similar to it. How would you say it distinguish how you, it distinguishes it from that that older um, idea? Well, it's very similar to Lamarckism actually, and uh, and Darwin. Uh, was a Lamarckian. Darwin strongly believed in the inheritance of acquired characters. Um, in his book, The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, mm -hmm. he has a whole chapter on what he calls his theory of pangenesis, where he suggests that when organisms acquire a new pattern of behavior or adaptation to their environment, some gemules, he called them, small particles, uh, accumulate in the egg and sperm cells and the inherited, the acquired characters are passed on to the next generation. Now, what makes the neo-Darwinian theory of evolution different from Darwinian evolution is that they said you can't have an inheritance of acquired characters, it's just genes. So Richard Dawkins type neo-Darwinism uh, rules out the inheritance of acquired characters, Lamarckian inheritance or Darwinian inheritance, because uh, Darwin provided more of an explanation than Lamarck and he did this much later. Lamarck was around 1800, and this book of Darwin's is about 1880. Um, so, yes, the inheritance of acquired characters in the 20th century biology was a terrible heresy, and it was sort of drummed out of town. You know, anyone who showed any sympathy to it was mercilessly persecuted in 20th century biology departments, except in the Soviet Union, where it was the official theory and the Darwinians were persecuted. Um, and so this polarized the debate even more, the fact that it became part of the Cold War, the opposite sides of the Cold War had opposite theories of inheritance. Um, but since the year 2000, uh, Lamarckian inheritance has been rebranded epigenetic inheritance. 
and it's now generally agreed this really does happen. Lamarck was right, Darwin was right, um, Dawkins was wrong in saying it doesn't happen. Um, and because this affects the way we think about evolution, this has fed into what's called the new evolutionary synthesis, a much broader theory of evolution than neo-Darwinism, which focused on genes and changes in gene frequency in population genetics. And the extended evolutionary synthesis includes epigenetic inheritance, which is really the inheritance of acquired characters. Um, and this makes it very different because it means if an organism, say a caterpillar, uh, is on a, a new food plant and it learns to eat a new kind of leaf, then we already know that it's when it turns into a butterfly or moth, it will lay its eggs on that new food plant, which opens up a whole new ecological niche for it. And when this is epigenetically inherited, their descendants will lay their eggs on this new food plant. And so you'll have a complete new range of environmental opportunity in a single generation, whereas Neo-Darwinism, would you'd have to wait years for a random mutation that might lead it to eat this new food plant, and then you'd have to wait many more generations for the frequency of that gene to increase within the population. So this leads to much more rapid and adaptive and intelligent and creative evolution. Um, so anyway, the morphic resonance you see provides a means by which Lamarckian inheritance could happen, but where it differs from epigenetic theories and Lamarckian theories is that morphic resonance says it doesn't depend on the genes or even on epigenetic modifications of the genes. Um, what it do, it just depends on similarity. So if you train rats to learn a new trick in one place, I'm not, a, Lamarckian inheritance would say their offspring might learn it quicker because it's been passed on through epigenetic molecular mechanisms. I would say, yes, that would happen, but it would also be learned quicker by all rats of that same breed um, without having to be descended from those parents. So morphic right. resonance would allow it to be more general than just descended from trained parents. And so that's the difference. It's similar to Lamarckism, but it goes further. Okay. This, this naturally raises the question, at least in, in my mind, because I'm trained as a physicist, is to what is the mechanism by this work? So, I mean, you've mentioned, um, you know, that the idea of someone doing Wordle in the morning, a whole pile of people doing Wordle in the morning, and then in the evening, somehow right across the world, that similarity of getting that that correct means that it'll be easier to do the Wordle in the in the evening. And uh, I can understand the principle. But what I don't see here is how does it actually work. Is there a kind of a morphogenic field or some kind which which permeates everywhere, which then carries this influence? How is the influence carried from one, one location to another? Well, that's the postulate of the hypothesis. It says it's by resonance based on similarity. And what I'm suggesting is there's a kind of a new kind of phenomenon that's not part of existing physics at all, which is why it's puzzling and strange that it's a postulate that on the basis of similar patterns of vibration in self-organizing systems, there's a resonance across space and time from the past to the present. So it's not as if this memory is stored in some kind of cosmic cloud or Akashic record, because when we're talking about memory, uh, if we say, where is it? That's the wrong question. Me memory is a relation in time, not space. Um, what I'm suggesting is there's a direct resonance across time and space. Um, that enables this similarity to be transmitted. I think it works through what I call morphic fields, which organize developing organisms and brains. And, and I think it works by biasing the probabilities of otherwise indeterminate events. So imposing a pattern on otherwise chaotic uh, events or uh, in, indeterminate events. Now, how it moves across space and time is of course, uh, mind-bogglingly difficult to conceive in terms, you can't conceive of it in terms of existing textbook physics. That's why it's controversial. Um, but several physicists have suggested that there might be ways this could be um, brought together with physics. 
David Bohm, the uh, quantum physicist who you're very familiar with, um, thought that morphic resonance worked through what he called the implicate order, that there's an invisible implicate order which is folded out into the world, explicated into the world we experience, but it's an invisible underlying order. And he thought that uh, at the quantum level, and he thought that the implicate order had a kind of memory. So if rats learn a new trick in one place, then it changes the implicate order for rats so that next time they learn uh, there's a, a confronted with the same trick somewhere else, they draw on that memory from the implicate order. So Bohm's theory was that it worked through the implicate order. Now, whether that is an explanation or whether it's just words is another question. Um, though Bernard Carr, who is a, a theoretical physicist, um, takes seriously the 10 or 11 dimensions in superstring or M theory, and he thinks that those extra dimensions uh, could easily allow for connections of the kind I'm talking about through morphic resonance. So there's, it's not as if physics is actually stuck in a three-dimensional or four-dimensional universe. Uh, modern, you know, people used to say, well, maybe these strange phenomena depend on an extra dimension, and people would say, oh, rubbish, there can't possibly be an extra dimension. Well, extra dimensions come cheap in modern physics. There's lots of them, and uh, they're, they're definitely rather underemployed in standard physics. Bernard but Carr's, 26 dimensions on some theories, yes. Yes, so, so Bernard Carr's trying to give them something to do, and one useful thing for them to do would be to uh, uh, enable more resonance to take place. Um, <coughs> I should point out that morphic resonance, as I said already, is applies only to self-organizing systems. It doesn't apply to cars, computers, tables, chairs, teaspoons, socks, and so on, which are not self-organizing. They're all things made in factories. That's why we have factories. Um, so it doesn't apply to machines. And mechanistic science is based on the machine metaphor as the primary metaphor for everything in nature, which is why people always say, what's the mechanism? Um, so um, what I'm suggesting is that uh, this is much more consistent with a kind of organic universe where the whole universe is more like an organism than a machine. Um, uh, uh, and living organisms are living organisms, not machines. Um, so machines are actually a very bad metaphor for nature since they're the only things that don't have morphic resonance apart from sort of piles of sand or aggregates. Um, so anyway, that's the postulate and it's, as you say, it's a testable hypothesis. Yeah. It will not be right. Most of its opponents uh, aren't even concerned with discussing whether it might be right or wrong. They just assume it must be wrong. But um, I think there are a lot of open questions in science, and morphic resonance would help to answer some of them. Yes. The, I mean, when you talk of resonance, the reason why I, I'm thinking as a physicist, when you talk of resonance, something needs to resonate. So there needs to be a medium which resonates. So, and therefore, it, it implies the idea of a wave, and a wave implies the idea of some medium which is, which is oscillating in some way or resonates yes. in some respect. And uh, I mean, there, there are possible echoes with, with, with Bohm's idea of the, the quantum potential, which is a field which goes out to infinity and, and we don't really understand how it works, but it provides a probability of the, the, where particles are. But I wanted to ask you something else, just a switch uh, idea for, for a moment, because um, the other thing which it evokes in, in me is, an, uh, is, a, is, a, is a feeling that does this connect in any way with Carl Jung's idea of the uh, the collective unconsciousness, the idea that um, not just individuals have an unconsciousness, but that there is a collective unconsciousness amongst uh, uh, everyone, such that which which Carl Jung said was encoded in, into the myths and and the ideas and, uh, of histories of of, of uh, society and civilizations. But does this have any connection? in your mind to that or is it completely separate and different no it's very connected i think that if the collective unconscious didn't exist it would have to be invented from the point of view of morphic resonance because what jung was saying is we all tap into a kind of collective memory which is full of archetypes which are kind of collective patterns of experience mm -hmm. fundamental patterns of experience 
uh, I would call them morphic fields. Um, and that uh, people from different cultures, from different parts of the world, can all draw upon this common human collective unconscious. He did think the collective unconscious was more specific and stronger uh, when it was people who were more similar uh, to, you know, more similar culturally or racially to a given person. But all humans are similar to some degree, so it includes the whole of humanity. And I would say that a collective memory of that kind is present in every species, not just humans. But the human one, of course, includes human archetypes, myths, stories, symbols. We have a richer collective unconscious than, say, monkeys or or cats, because we have a wider range of experience and language and thought and so on. So, um, yes, I would say it fits very well. And in fact, when my book, A New Science of Life, first came out in 1981, um, the people who were the most friendly and most excited about it were various Jungian groups, because they immediately spotted that this was, um, it could provide a basis for Jung's theory, which in conventional mechanistic science has no basis. So Jung is regarded as a pseudoscience, uh, Jungianism within conventional science, whereas this would make it much more grounded in, in biology and science. Right. I know that, I mean, I, I, I've got a copy of the uh, the book, The New Science of Life, and it's a very interesting reading. It's a... Uh... It's it's revolutionary in its its form and and, and quite challenging in in to, to normal science. You've indi indicated that although some people accepted it rather readily, some other people didn't. Did the reaction to the book that you got? How was that? And and did it surprise you? I knew it would be controversial. I first thought of the idea exactly fifty years ago in nineteen seventy three when I was a don in. Clare College, Cambridge. Um, and when I, st I was very excited when I first thought of it, it was a sudden flash. And then I realized over the next few days how many different phenomena this could help to explain and help to revolutionize science in a much more holistic direction. Um, but when I discussed it with my colleagues in the biochemistry department, it was very clear that most of them were going to be incredibly skeptical forever about such an idea. It was so far away from the way most people were thinking. Uh, when I discussed it with philosophers and historians and others in my own college on High Table, um, they were much more sympathetic. And so, so I realized that actually it was a whole spectrum of responses. And I didn't feel I could publish the book or publish this idea until I'd thought it through. So I didn't, from 1973 to 1981, um, I was thinking about it and developing the ideas further. I took a job in India working in an agricultural research institute, the International Crops Research Institute in Hyderabad, um, where I was literally working with my feet on the ground in actual fields, um, doing practical work, which I very much enjoyed uh, because agriculture is much more holistic than laboratory biology has to be. You're doing experiments in actual fields with weather and insect pests and, and so forth. Um, so while I was thinking about it, then, so I realized that it would be controversial when it came out. Um, what I was hoping was for a debate within science and um, tests of the hypothesis to happen in sort of mainstream laboratories. The first three or four months, everything went swimmingly well. I gave seminars in a range of universities. The Guardian wrote a very favorable review. It was very well reviewed in New Scientist, and which wrote a very nice introduction to the whole theory. And um, I wrote an article in New Scientist describing the theory. So everything was going very well. Until a few months later, there was an editorial in Nature on the front page of Nature called A Book for Burning, written by the editor, Sir John Maddox. Um, and Maddox was incredibly angry about this book and was very, very upset about it and um, wrote it. It was one of the most intemperate emotional pieces that most people can remember reading in a scientific journal denouncing the book and basically saying that I should be excommunicated from the scientific world. Um, he compared himself to the Pope um, and uh, me to Galileo, which wasn't a very fortunate uh, oh. 
a comparison for him to no, make. I think if anyone understood history, they'd prefer to be on the side of Galileo rather than the Pope. Well, exactly. It wasn't, a, but he, he was really angry, and that's what came to his mind. He was like the Pope condemning Galileo, as he said, for the same reason, it's heresy. Um, so he proclaimed it a heresy. And, of course, it was very good for book sales, but the first edition sold out within days, and my publisher was delighted, and the presses were sort of... Uh, pouring um, more volumes off the presses to because the demand suddenly rocketed and um, it meant the whole idea was much more widely discussed. It did have a negative effect as well though because it meant that from then on having been proclaimed a heretic and being excommunicated I couldn't get lab space and I couldn't get grants from any official agencies so it definitely impaired my ability to do research in laboratories so which is why I had to find a way of doing research in the field and doing research in agriculture actually prepared me for this because in agriculture you do field research in real fields and statistics as we know it uh, was invented by R. A. Fisher in the night in before the second world war to deal with agricultural research I mean statistical research was really started with agriculture then, then it was applied to medicine and clinical trials and so on it started with agriculture um, because it was how, how do you do research in the field, actual fields, when fields are patchy and you might have a damp patch and you might have a bit that's sort of shaded by a tree and stuff is not uniform. So he developed the method of replicates, uh, doing all trials in replications and then the analysis of variants and so forth. These research techniques were developed for agriculture originally. Um, and I then found that I uh, had to do research under field conditions. Um, uh, most of my research, in fact, almost all of it since uh, 1981 has been done in the real world um, because I don't have a laboratory. I have a small one at home, but I can't do anything very sophisticated. Um, so um, I was forced to work in this way, but actually I think it's an advantage. Um, for example, I do research on telephone telepathy. That's one of the other topics I do research on. Um, can people tell when a particular person's calling them on the phone? A lot of people think they can. Um, so I do those research, that research in people's houses and on automated tests on mobile phones. Uh, I've done research on telepathy in dogs, uh, which I do not in laboratories, but in people's homes, dogs that know when their owners are coming home. I wrote a whole book on my research with animals. Um, so uh, in terms of research techniques and methods, um, I've been forced as a result of the editor of Nature to develop and push forward whole ways of working in the field, which are used in other sciences too, particularly medicine and agriculture. but. Um, are now being increasingly used in psychology and in, of course, social psychology. Um, so anyway, that's, that's uh, in relation to research methods. Um, it's one consequence of all that is this field approach to research through field studies. So your, um, the reaction to your book anyway was, um, uh, let's say, mixed in, certain, in some ways. Well, well yeah, it still is, yes. <laughs> yeah. Would you say that science is open to new ideas or that to science i'm talking about uh, established science as run by scientists today is it open to new ideas still or is it a closed kind of society well it's not very open to new ideas if they're radically new if they're very minor new ideas you know like um this enzyme's activated by calcium well Maybe it's activated by magnesium as well. That's OK. Uh, you can do experiments, you can publish papers and stuff. Um, it's uh, open to uh, technology and business are open to new ideas. You know, you know, if you come up with a new algorithm for artificial intelligence or something, then you'll find plenty of investors. Um, but academic science is not very open to new ideas, partly because of the whole structure is partly a natural conservatism, uh, partly because it's fossilized into a whole set of dogmas, which is what I discuss in my book, The Science Delusion. I discuss the 10 
principal dogmas of contemporary science, and I show how they're actually holding back research. Um, it's also partly because people have careers, you do a PhD in someone's lab, you learn the techniques and you become part of that kind of scientific subculture. Um, and you're hyper specialized. So it's very difficult to move into another field from there. And the whole thing's set up so you get grants and the whole grant system tends to reward people who make incremental improvements along existing lines. But if you apply for a grant for something radically new, uh, it won't do well in the peer review process and, and the grant givers want to make sure they'll see something for their money. And if it's just an incremental improvement along existing lines, they, it's slow but steady and they prefer that to something that's risky and might not work. Um, but you, you would think that any scientist who has read Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions might well be on the lookout for something which is a little bit more than just a small incremental change to what they've got. Because all the all the biggest and most important discoveries seem to come in the revolutionary form, don't they? Yes, but the, the message that most scientists reading Kuhn might take from that is that what Kuhn points out is that for most of the time, what he calls normal science uh, is extremely resistant to anomalies, the things that don't fit in. And scientists work within an established framework of theory and practice. Um, and, and normal science is extremely resistant to new ideas. That's what Kuhn actually shows. Yeah. And you might think, well, aren't scientists busy looking, as you suggest, busy looking out for new ideas, big new ideas? Well, the answer is that most of them aren't, because they think we've already understood the nature of reality. There, there's no need for big new ideas. We've already reached our ultimate understanding of nature. It's machine-like, mechanical, Biology is determined by molecules and genes. Memories are stored in brains. The mind's nothing but the activity of the brain, so it's just a matter of more neurophysiology and neuroscience to find out how consciousness works and so on. Um, they think we've already <clears throat> understood reality and principle, leaving any of the details to be filled in. So yeah, what, what you're describing, though, is, is uh, scientific materialism. That's, uh... that's right. Well, that's the dominant paradigm at the moment. And for materialists, they can't see that there's any better or alternative theory. So they're not looking for new ideas. And all my ideas would tend to undermine scientific materialism. So uh, they see these as ideas that need to be branded heretical, rejected and kept at bay. Mm -hmm. So no, not everyone within science is a scientific materialist. Um, but it's still the dominant orthodoxy, and if you want to get ahead, um, it's difficult to challenge it. Um, because you may not get your papers published, you may not get grants, you won't get a job, and so forth. So this is why, for example, in psychic research, there's hardly anyone doing research on telepathy or um, precognition or uh, the sense of being stared at, subjects I myself am very interested in. And the reason that no one does research on these, you can't get grants for them from official grant giving agencies. If someone says you want, they want to do a PhD on the subject, everyone will advise them, look, this is a, there's hardly any universities that will tolerate this subject. You won't get a job, you know, it's career suicide, better to do something standard and accepted and more conventional first. And then maybe when you retire, you could take up some of these projects. Um, but so people are advised against it. And this is true of any unconventional area. So mm. um, it's just unfortunately not the case that people read Kuhn and say, let's look out for the next big idea. Um, they assume that Kuhn's analysis applied in the past to Galileo and, and, and Darwin and so on, and Einstein, but um, not that it would apply any longer today. Right. Being being anti-materialist in the way in which the, your ideas are and, and looking for something beyond mere materialism, does this open up uh, an area for um, discussion with various faiths? I mean, we have uh, we've often seen, you mentioned Galileo and the Pope, the idea that these 
two things, science on the one hand and faith on the other hand, are, as Stephen Jay Gould said, um, non-overlapping magisteria. Do you see them as, as completely separate or does your ideas enable a, a closer union between those things? I think they lead to a closer union. Um, my two most recent books are about the scientific study of spiritual practices. There have now been many scientific studies, uh, thousands of them, of religious and spiritual practices that basically show that people who have these practices are happier, healthier and live longer than people that don't. They have measurable and usually beneficial effects, like meditation, for example, has <clears throat> You know, effects on blood pressure, reduces insomnia, protects against depression. You know, there are measurable effects in statistical experiments uh, of meditation. Now, um, and the same is true of prayer, the same is true of fasting, the same is true of uh, connecting with nature, the same is true of belonging to religious communities which give a community support and uh, rites of passage and so on. Um, but sorry, sorry to interrupt. Are these things still connected to the idea of morphic resonance? I mean, is prayer somehow tapping into morphic resonance? Is that how you see it? Or are these two things quite disjoint? Well, I think that they're, how they tap in, how they relate, is that the mechanistic worldview says nature is purposeless, the universe is unconscious and inanimate, the mind's nothing but the activity of the brain, and it's all inside the head. Now, the more holistic view that I'm suggesting uh, suggests the mind is much more extensive than the brain. Our minds are like fields that stretch out beyond our brains, just like the fields of magnets stretch out beyond the magnet or the gravitational field of the earth stretches out beyond the earth or the field of a mobile phone stretches invisibly beyond the phone uh, through the radio waves. Um, so I'm suggesting minds are more extensive than brains. So if you pray about something, um, say you're praying for somebody in Australia, uh, from the normal point of view, you're just wasting your time. You're just changing the nerve impulses and neurotransmitters inside your own brain, and it can't possibly have any effect except by maybe making you feel better or giving you a kind of glow or something that might possibly reduce your blood pressure or something. Um, but um, if your mind reaches out over long distances, then we can be connected at a distance. And I think that happens in telepathy. I mean, that's why I wrote books on this sort of thing, and like dogs that know when their owners are coming home, pick up their owners' intentions from a distance. So I think minds are extended, and that makes a difference to ideas about prayer. I think memories are not stored in brains, which makes a difference to theories of survival. If memories are stored in the brain, then when you die, your brain decays and all your memories are wiped out. Mm -hmm. So any theory of survival, whether it's rebirth, reincarnation, purgatory, the last judgment, or whatever, heaven and hell, um, any of these ideas are immediately refuted by the memory and the brain theory. It just says all these things are totally impossible. If, the, if memories are not stored in brains, brains tune into them, but they don't store them, um, then the memories are not eliminated by death. And in fact, I'm suggesting that we're influenced by the memories of countless previous people through the collective memory we all inherit and tune into. Mm -hmm. um, but it may also be that there could be personal survival of bodily death. It leaves the question open. It doesn't prove it. But the conventional theory leaves the question closed, slams the door on this. So um, also, if we take the view that nature is alive, that animals and plants are truly alive, the earth's alive. The sun is in a sense alive, I think. I wrote a paper recently called Is the Sun Conscious? discussing the possible consciousness of the sun. Panpsychism, the idea that there's consciousness throughout nature, is an increasingly popular idea in philosophy and neuroscience even. Um, that a living universe uh, where the stars, the galaxies may be conscious and alive, the whole universe may be conscious, uh, is, a, is much more like the worldview in which all religions and shamanism grew up, which grows up in the context of living nature. In the Middle Ages, here in Europe, people thought that nature was alive, um, animals and plants were truly alive, 
um, the Earth was alive, the stars and planets were living beings, um, according to a medieval philosophy. And that's the philosophy which gave us our great Gothic cathedrals, which are expressions of a worldview, of an, an anime, uh, a kind of animism, um, a worldview of a living nature. No. That, I think, is much more favourable to religion and shamanism, all religions, than a view of a mechanistic materialism, a pointless, mechanical, unconscious universe with minds nothing but brains. Right. Can I ask you this? What What does the future hold for Rupert Sheldrake? I mean, do you have any further ambitions or drives and desires to, to look at other areas or things which you've got coming up at the moment what what is um, what are what plans might you have for further research or work well i'm probably in the most scientifically productive phase of, i've been for many years at the moment oh. i do very few interviews and talks at the moment i'm yours is an exception because i try and do things that reach students and then my priority is students um and since you're teaching in a university this is um, an exception, but mostly I'm doing research. I've published about six or seven papers in peer-reviewed papers this year, peer-reviewed journals this year. The latest one was on the sense of being stared at, being directional. Um, the one before that was on end-of-life experiences in dogs, cats, and other animals, where they have a kind of surge of energy just before they die, similar to what happens to people. Um, uh, there's another one in the press on telephone telepathy, automated tests using mobile phones. Um, I, I wrote, wrote last year, I had this paper on Is This Unconscious? Um, before that, I had one in the Proceedings of the Royal Society on cellular senescence and rejuvenation, taking up ideas that I worked on in Cambridge and um, I've returned to recently. Um, so uh, I'm working on a whole range of different areas and I have several experiments going on right now including uh, a whole new morphic resonance experiment that I'm discussing tomorrow with the research team planning out the first phase of the experiments uh, in a new lab um, so yeah a lot actually can, can I can I ask you one final question then before we conclude and that is if you had maybe just one piece of advice that you'd like to hold out to to new scientists who are just starting out today, based upon your own experiences and all the things that you've learned, what would the, your one piece of advice be to to new scientists? That's very difficult because it depends on whether they want to, uh, you know, have a secure job and be able to pay their mortgage. Um, if that's the primary motive, have a secure career and pay the mortgage, then probably best just to stick to conventional science and not think too much. Um, but if people are curious about a, a wider view of nature, I would suggest, I mean, this may sound like self-promotion, read my book, The Science Delusion, to see how the different branches of science, I cover a wide range there, um, could be much freer and more productive if they were more open-minded. And then try and find a research area that's fundable, um, that's feasible to do, where you, um, and to open up a, help open up a new field of science. I believe that a big scientific revolution is bound to come sooner or later. The only question is how soon or how late. I think it's bound to come. And I think that anyone who uh, can is aware of what might happen and is already working in a more holistic direction would be well placed when this revolution does come to move into a leading role in this new kind of science that I think we're going to see this more holistic science. Um, but it will involve being discreet and, uh, you know, and assessing how risky one feels one, how many risks one thinks one can take. When I took the risk of publishing my book on morphic resonance, I wasn't married, I didn't have a mortgage, uh, and I didn't have children to support, and I felt much freer. I think if I'd been married with a family to support and a mortgage to pay, 
I might have been much less adventurous. So uh, it depends on people's personal circumstances. It's not just about ideas. It's a bit of a, a sad indictment, though, on science and, and, and the the systems that we've set up to pursue science, that people are not able to follow what they believe to be the truth, wherever it might lead, without there being some kind of consequences. Well, it is sad, but I, I we, you know, science is a, a social institution, which is, you know, is part of, it's funded either by government money or by corporate money, or to some degree by, you know, the whim of billionaires. And thank goodness for eccentric billionaires, because that's why my work's been supported over the years, I've not had a penny of public funding, nor of corporate funding. Um, so, um, it's it's hard to get it supported um but i think things will change and i think it's possible to find areas where change is more likely to happen than others for example in consciousness studies um, there are now many areas which are genuinely interesting and opening up new terrain which are being funded for example like this new psychedelic research that's going on or research on near-death experiences or research on altered states of consciousness uh, all of this is pushing the boundaries of what we know but it's still funded and can be done within the bounds of regular science and there's also scope for people to do research outside scientific institutions a lot of my own work uh, can be done as i mentioned under field conditions and in my book seven experiments that could change the world subtitled a do-it-yourself guide to revolutionary science I suggest how people, um, preferably with a scientific background, can actually do low cost research that could make a really big difference. And I'm very keen on that as well. Um, so, but, so it slightly depends on whether people want to pursue a well paid career in science that will ensure a smooth rise through the ranks to being a prestigious professor. Rupert Sheldrake, thank you ever so much for a fascinating conversation and, and for your time today. It's been, been brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.